God's Way is the sermon series we're in, and I want to talk to you today about how to have a happy marriage. If you're not careful, you learn what you learn about marriage from the world. The Bible says in Colossians 2.8, be careful lest the vain philosophies of this world pull you away from the basic principles of Christ. So we're going to hit at some of those vain philosophies today. But you say, what do you mean? I mean like music, you know, there's no real commitment in popular music these days. It's mostly dysfunctional relationships and, and you know, it's about sexuality. And, and even on television and the movies, quite honestly, they, you know, there's people cheating on people. And, and we know that's reality in real life at times. But, but you're not going to learn anything from those guys. You're not going to learn anything worth knowing from those, those venues. So you got to get what you get from God. And where do you get that? Well, you get it in the Bible. But let's look at a, a few marriages that are celebrity and let's see how they did. These are marriages that uh, didn't last very long. Nicolas Cage and Lisa Marie Presley were married for 108 days. Kim Kardashian and Chris Humphreys were married for 72 days together. He was an NBA athlete. Um, Drew Barrymore and Jeremy Thomas, 39 days. And the winners for the shortest marriage are Britney Spears and Jason Alexander, 55 hours. So, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, you know, it's two whole days. So, so what I'm saying is they're the most popular people in the world, <clears throat> but they don't know principally how to do life. And I don't want to maximize their pain anyway. God loves them. We love them as well. But what I want you to know is that's not where you look to figure it out. And that's how, that's how we're learning these days, just by whatever experiences we have online, on, in television, in our concerts, whatever it may be. And those things permeate us deeply if we don't put God first. So Matthew 7, 24, this is a scripture about all of life. It's Jesus speaking, but you can rest assured that marriage is part of this. We're talking about marriage today. And it says, and, and, and by the way, let me just say this. If you're single, you haven't messed up being here today, all right? Because the principles that I'm going to give you are the same principles that are necessary for every relationship to flourish. Friendship. So they're friendship principles. But also, if you're young or single and you want to be married, you're probably going to be because you have that desire of your heart. We'll pray with you that the Lord will lead you to the right, that, that right person. But get your heart ready now. Become the person that you hope to marry. Get close to the Lord. And these principles that we're sharing, if you'll apply them now, they're going to bless your marriage when you go forward and step into that. So this is for everyone. Nobody, you know, uh, I remember one time I did a sermon on marriage many, many years ago in the church. And uh, someone who was brand new in the church and single stood up and said to our singles pastor, Pastor Alex, what in the H-E double toothpicks am I supposed to do with that? So I, I, uh, what they meant is that didn't have anything to do with me at all. But it does. It does have to do with you because it, they're principles about relationship. And, and here's what God said. Let's, let's have marriage in mind here for a moment as we look at this because this covers everything. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 24, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. That's kind of a family word, house house. And then the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew. Let me just stop there and say a perfect marriage is a myth. A life that's just filled with favor and no problems with God. I don't know who might be teaching you that, but if you pray hard enough, everything's going to be perfect. Nope. Nope. All you have to do is look at all the great men and women in the Bible and see all of their trials. They're more spiritual than you and I will probably ever be. Uh, as, you, as you look at Jesus who was crucified and spoken evil of and persecuted himself. I mean, if, if Jesus went through stuff, we're going to go through stuff. He said, if you live godly in life, you will be persecuted. But people we love will die. Relationships will wane or struggle at times. But this, so this is reality. Jesus says, when the floods came, not if they came, and the winds blew, let's think about life there, and beat on the house. There's that family word again. It didn't fall because the house had been founded on the rocks. So when the winds, when it was, when it was built on the sand, the house fell. That's the philosophies of the world. But when it's built on the rock, Jesus Christ, and the principles of God, the house stands. So my very first point today, and this will seem so simple, but the, the simplest things are the most profound, and it's like the fundamentals of any sport. You got to know the fundamentals if you're ever going to succeed at a higher level. <laughs> And so we're going to talk about things that make the huge difference for that foundation today. 
The first is this, happiness in your marriage starts with giving God first place. Now, a better way to say that would probably be giving the first place in your life for each individual. But let's just, let's just bring it together in marriage here, that, that the couple, we as a couple, would put God first in our lives, which means God's ahead of your spouse, which means your relationship with Jesus is the most important relationship. And you say, well, no, no, I really love my spouse. Well, <clears throat> you'll never know how to love them the best way if Jesus isn't first. Because Jesus will teach you not to be selfish and he'll show you how to, to lean into who they are and bless them. The Holy Spirit will lead you to, in, so that you can learn how to love in the very best ways. And you won't get that if you don't put him first. You'll just be trying to figure it out on your own. So how do you put God first? Well, I'm going to talk about three basic things here. First, you, 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 the Bible has to be the most important thing to you when it comes to direction. Like it's not, it's not, not only not the world, it's not self-help, it's, it's, not, even, it's not even Christian books. <laughs> Christian books aren't necessarily always biblical, by the way. Um, so cri cri Christian, they're, they're trying, and, I'm, and I like Christian books, but I like the Bible better than Christian books, because this, this one's the, it's, it's the inerrant word of God. But did you know there are 28 verses about marriage in the Bible? There are 19 verses mentioning a wedding in the Bible, 132 verses mention a husband, 302 mention a mother, 439 verses mention a wife, 1,083 mention a father, look at the importance of the father there, 555 mention children, 2,558 total mentions of family in the Bible. Well, there's only 31,102 verses in the Bible. So that 2,558 verses is 8% of the Bible that directly speaks to the family. Huh. So this is something that you've got to know. You've got to dig in. You've got to want the truth that's in there. And then you've got to have a heart to live by it. Because knowing it or un and, and understanding it and living it are two different things. So here's another verse. That, this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. The Bible means so much to me. I've, I've never seen the Bible proven wrong. I just never have. And what I mean by that is my own personal, let's take my own personal experiences. When I read it and I understand it and I live it out, I'm blessed. When I read it and I don't live it out, I've gotten myself in trouble along, along the way. God's not trying to make you do what he wants you to do. He could throw a, ring a fire around us now and say, bow or burn. He has all power in his hands, but he's letting us figure it out on our own. He's given us a love letter to lead us. He loves us, so he's lovingly leading us, and we choose whether or not we're gonna embrace the word by getting into it, or if we're gonna embrace it as well, even further by following it. Joshua 1.8, one of my favorite verses. This book of the law, <clears throat> speaking of the Bible, <clears throat> shall not depart from your mouth but you shall meditate on it day and night. To meditate, if you look in the original Hebrew, the idea is almost like a cow that chews its cud. We probably don't know what that means in this culture, but it means that there's something in their mouth that they're ruminating on on a regular basis. That you should meditate on it day and night, so that's every day, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. So not just understanding it, but being careful to do it, what happens is then you'll make your way prosperous if you, if you put the word into your life. I told someone in between services, did you know that even if you didn't know Jesus Christ, if you put all the principles of the word in play, like integrity and compassion and just all the wonderful principles that God has put in his word, that you would have some success in life. You wouldn't be saved because you're not saved because of excellence or because you do things well or because things go well. You're saved solely by the grace of God. Uh, but, but I mean, even if you don't know him, you can put integrity into play and it'll bless you, but it's true in all areas of our life. If you put it in play, you'll be prosperous and then you'll have good success. So, so you wanna have success in your marriage? Get into the word and put it into play in your life. Make it important. That means when you hear a cool verse uh, that, 
that was on marriage on the radio or in a sermon, you might write it down and you and your wife might talk about it. That means you're, or your husband, that means you're reading the word every day and you're discussing things. Karen and I do our daily devotions in the morning and we stop and talk about verses and what that means to us in the moment, what it might mean for, for our families. And it's just part of our regular thing that we do. And we just think the word is the best thing that God's ever given us to really understand how it's supposed to work. Otherwise, you're gonna make it up yourself or get it from people who don't know. Secondly, prayer. If God is at the center of your marriage and he's number one in the marriage, then talking to him will be a priority to you. Couples praying, when a couple prays together, beyond sexuality, it's probably the most intimate act that you could do together. Just pray for one another. There's a vulnerability there. You're sharing yourself. You're sharing with each other about what you're going through. Now, some may say, well, man, I, you know, I don't like that whole praying out loud thing. Well, I just want to say this as tender as I can. Get over it. Just get over it, okay? It's just you and him or you and her, right? And, and you're just talking to God. You say, how do you pray? You just talk to him, just like you'd talk to your spouse. Is your spouse sick? Are they tired? Are they fearful? Are they insecure? It takes communication to figure all that out, right? Let, for their heart to come out, you spend time together, they let you know. Are they feeling ignored? Are they having a relationship problem with one of the children or a family member or someone at work? Are, are they just having friends where there's some mending that's needed? When you talk together and spend time together, these are just prayer requests. They're just coming out. Take hands with one another and just pray for one another. And here's what you're saying. What you're saying is, I realize my inadequacy to meet all of your needs, but I know the one who can. And I love you so much, I'm taking you to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords right now around these problems that you're feeling. And, and part of it is we gotta get real with one another and just, if it's stumbling through prayer, stumble through. God doesn't need a perfect prayer do you, do you need your six-year-old to say everything perfect, to love them and understand their heart? No. Well, I mean, that span is even bigger with our intellect and God's. All you have to do is be sincere, love your spouse, and know that his power is going to be released as you pray. We're putting the power of God into play over our marriages when we pray. Philippians 4, 6, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. About what? About everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. Now, this is for all Christians, but it certainly works wonderfully in marriage. Then you'll experience God's peace. So when you pray for your spouse, his peace will come, his strength, his wisdom comes. He says these things, if you want wisdom, ask, he says. It exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. If your spouse is feeling fear and feeling like you're not there for them, what happens is their peace leaves and, and they don't feel connected to you. But when you pray, you're not only connecting with God, you're letting them know we are intimately acquainted with God and each other and we're trusting him to help and he does, okay? Third, this is one I don't think this generation gets. And I, I, I think you do some things better. Like you can certainly run your phone better than I can run mine. Like I'm, I'm pretty sure I've got like 25% of the capacity figured out on that phone. Uh, but, I, but, I, but I got what I need. You're just great at technology and many other things if you're younger. But I, I just, this is just experience in a place that I've come to believe that there's a problem. When we grew up with our families and generations before us, we knew the importance of fellowshipping in a church and walking with other families at the same stage of life. Fellowshipping is walking with others in the body of Christ. And one of the reasons we're struggling in families these days is we're not in church with other families. We're not in community or even in small group with other families who are going through like things all the time, who love the Lord. And when you're in fellowship, you can share with one another, pray for one another, understand one another's needs and be there for one another. For instance, uh, I think we think social media is covering it. It's not covering it, you know? The irony of Facebook not being face-to-face, -face, you know? Uh, Instagram, TikTok, whatever it may be, you're, you're, you're seeing everybody else's highlights in their life, 
If they're real highlights even, we don't know. You know, they could be fake. And all it does is build this feeling of insecurity. But when you get together in life and you walk through life and both moms have this potty training issue with their daughters and, I mean, you're just talking life and someone, you know, your kid is not doing well and you're praying for one another, not, not gossiping, but you trust one another because you're together, uh, you, you just get through life in a better fashion. I think one of the gods we serve, or maybe better to say one of the churches we worship at these days is sports. And I just want to caution you. Like, I'm a guy who played two sports in college, played a little semi-pro baseball, spent a lot of years in sports, and I'm just here to tell you I wasted a lot of time. That's just the way I feel about it more. I like sports. But I'm, I'm just going to tell you something. Your kid's not going pro. I mean, probably not. He's just, you know, if you look at the odds, there's eight kids that get a full ride in football in the state of Oregon out of the tens of thousands that go to high school. Your kid's probably not one of them. So use sports. They can, the Bible speaks a lot about sports. You know, Paul says, he talks about a boxer and a runner. And we, there's so much to learn about life lessons in sports. But make sure that you never put it ahead of God. And here's one of the ways that they will think sports are more important than God. That's if you... You don't do church and you just do sports. Like, you know, we're, you, you, you know, you got all the coaches. You got all the coaches that can, that can help you. But I'm telling you, today you pray for those private coaches. You go on those tournaments. You do all that. You've paid for a college education before you even get there, man, uh, with everything that's needed these days. Just make sure they have fun and keep them in church. Because if you don't keep them in church, they'll someday be sitting on a couch watching somebody who's great at sports on TV and not going to church because we taught them that sports is more important than the family of God. Whoo, man, I don't, I hope, I like sports and I said that. How about that? But just, just be careful. You don't want them to come to a point. It's not just sports. It can be music. It can be whatever. Uh, just, just, just make sure they're fellowshipping. If you get them with other family members, their best friends become believers. If you get them in just sports, maybe some, maybe not. And they need that fellowship with other believers their age. They need their, so I believe this. We, Jesus is a friend to sinners, but he was a lot closer to those 12 apostles than he was the, those people that he was walking with. Meaning, you need to fellowship with believers. The, bad, the Bible says, man, I'm going a different direction in this sermon. I'm sorry. Uh, the Bible says that uh, bad company corrupts good character. And so that's something you got to watch over with your kids. And the best way you watch over is keep them in the youth group. Keep them in children's ministry. Get them to the activities. Make sure that they have fellowship with the body of Christ. And that's true for your whole family, but for your marriage too, because you'll come to a place where you need the church. Acts 2.46 says they were attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. There's, there's two major things happening weekly there. The small group in a home and the large corporate meeting like this. And those are both principled. The Bible says, forsake not the meeting of the saints together. Those are both principles in the scriptures. Jesus was in the, was in, was, was, um, in the temple daily it's not the temple I'm trying to think of. That's a different word. But, but he was daily in, in a church service on the Sabbath. And, and he was teaching there. He was receiving there. He's our example. So even Jesus, the son of God, was there on a regular basis. I'm just, I don't, I don't know. Maybe this is for someone online. Let's just say it's for someone online, okay? If we're sitting here. <clears throat> um. You're, you're, you're just not going to do, you're, you're listening to a lie if you think you can do it without the body of Christ. That's a lie. That's a lie from the devil. It's a subtle lie. Uh, meaning meaning uh, there are good people out there. You can be friends with unbelievers. I'm not, that's a sermon for another day. You know I'm into outreach and love and caring about everyone. But you need the body of Christ. You need them. And one of the reasons is, is they will pray with you. They will care about you. And they'll even call you to accountability, which I think is good. Because I want to do right and do well, right? But, but so, so I'll tell you about a season to just show you what it means. Um, even pastor goes through, I, I tend to try to be pretty positive. I don't really want you to know about all my problems. I really don't. Uh, you probably don't want me to know about all yours, right? Uh, but I want to make it more about you than about me and services when we're up here. So sometimes when I'm going through a hard season, you wouldn't hear about it. <clears throat> and... Um, Several years ago, we were going through a very difficult season 
where I had cancer and I had a 16th of my lip removed. As a matter of fact, I have this beard and mustache because part of my lip is gone uh, from, that, uh, from that surgery. Just, you know, just a sliver, but you could, you could tell it. And, and I, you know, I was even dealing with having to change the way I form my words because my lip, a portion of it is gone. And I'm a preacher, you know, so that, that wasn't an easy thing to be dealing with. But my daughter was going through uh, uh, a, a, a terrible disease. What was that called, Karen? thyroid eye disease where she had an operation where they literally took her eyeballs out of her socket, still connected to the nerves there, cleaned out, um, reamed it out, and shaved the bone in two areas. It's the most painful eye surgery. She was dealing with that for years, and she felt, un, un, she didn't feel beautiful. She, it was, dis, there was a lot of discouragement. And then there's some other things I won't even tell you about that were going on. Somebody who prayed and loved us said, hey, I'm just feeling like we need to pray for you. Would you be okay if we prayed for you? And I said, well, we do need prayer. Yes, I'd like you to pray. And they knew about some things, but they didn't know how deep it was, that it was just a lot on us. So they said, well, let's pray in a service, you know. We'll, we'll come down and we'll pray in the um, service. And I said, no, because I didn't want to take up our time to do that. Um, <clears throat> we don't get to pray for your individual needs. Sometimes we would in a prayer meeting, but, uh, you know, it's a corporate meeting. So I said, how about at the end of second service, if anybody wants to stay, they can come forward and pray. Well, the dynamic is such, I hope I can explain to you how, how meaningful it was to us. But we stood down here with our young adult children, right here in this space, and 60 or 70 people just gathered around. They stayed, they waited till everybody's gone, and then they gathered around, and they started to pray. And uh, all I can tell you is that tri those trials didn't go away immediately. Sometimes they don't. But God gives you strength and wisdom and peace to go through the journey sometimes. And that day, something was transferred from those prayers for us. That we felt his strength. We felt his love. But we also felt what it means to belong to the body of Christ and stay close to the body of Christ where you're covered and people care and they'll be with you. Second thought today. Man, this is a seven hour, 45 minute sermon. Uh, let's see if we can go faster. Happiness grows when both are focused on giving to the other. Okay. You have been raised American, which means you've been raised to be selfish. It's the way we are. Number one. Look out for number one. The, our world says, me time. I'm, I'm okay with some me time, by the way, but, but when it's all me, all the time, I'm, that's, that's not Bible. So, you know, well, uh, I, I'm not getting what I want out of this relationship. Or, uh, you, you know, this isn't worth it for me to stay in because I'm not, I'm not, I want you to give me more attention. I want you, the whole focus on, um, uh, from Americans and our, and the way we live is just make it about me. And we're really taught to ingrain selfishness. It's completely the opposite of the Bible. Completely the opposite. The Bible says that we are to be like Jesus who gave himself up for us. That we're to be like Jesus, who esteemed us better than himself. The Bible says that we should turn our focus to blessing others instead of being blessed. If your focus is to be, be blessed, and you don't have enough people blessing you, it can lead to discouragement and maybe even depression. If your focus is on blessing people, you can bless people every day. And the Bible says it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And that is the principle in marriage as well. Philippians 2 talks to us about preferring the other above ourselves. Now think of marriage. This is for the whole body of Christ, but it's true in marriage. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is from a paraphrase of the Bible called the message, but I like the way it says it and it's still accurate. If you have a heart, if you care, then do me a favor. Agree with each other. Love each other. Be deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and put others and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. Putting the other ahead of yourself. You say, they'll take advantage of me. And I know that's the temptation to, to, that you want to you yield to. Like they're, they're already not thinking about me enough. <clears throat> But do you think that Jesus is bad because you put him, he put himself, that he put you ahead of himself? That he died for your sins, that he came and served you? No, I mean, he's the best. 
And what I'm telling you is your esteem and the love that people have for you will grow when you get your eyes off yourself and more onto them. Now, <clears throat> I would say this. I think we have an orientation towards that with our children today in our society, but we don't have it towards our marriage partner. So what happens is we teach children that they're the most important thing, more important than the spouse, which I think is a big mistake. Because if you teach them they're the most important thing, when they get ready to have a relationship, what are they gonna do when they go into that relationship? They're gonna go in thinking, I'm the most important thing. They're not going in to serve. But if you can show them how much you love each other, how much you care for one another, how much the, your time together is meaningful, what happens is you're gonna have kids that are more balanced, who know more how to serve someone instead of demand that they're served, and it'll be better going forward. We need to learn how to serve and bless one another. And I would say this, the best marriage is a marriage where two people are living it to outbless the other. Like, I want to bless you, and that is my focus. Now, I can't say Karen and I have had this down perfectly, but, but man, we're, we, we, we very much try to live this. Like, I want her to know how great she is. And she easily makes me feel great because she's always loving me, and, and we're giving to each other, and she's more important to me than myself. God's the most important to me, but she's more important to me than myself. And listen, serve your kids, love your kids, be there for your kids. Don't, don't misread that. Like I want you to, but don't miss the fact that the most important relationship in that home after Jesus is you and your spouse. Like they need to see how much you love each other and you're committed to one another. So you give, how do you do this? You, you know, um, happiness grows when you're focused on giving to the other. Well, you give conversation. Recreation. Brown Bannister wrote a song about communication in marriage, and it goes like this, the lyrics. Talk to one another. Learn to talk it out. We've got to know exactly what the other's about. But when we talk to one another, just like the Father above, we've got to learn to say it in love. So when you know what the other is about, you're spending time with them asking for their heart to come forward. Really interested in what they I think one of the best things you can do is how's, how'd your day go and be serious. How, how was your day today? And then listen to whatever's coming through. And then that's when the prayer and the conversation and the counsel and the love can grow as we're doing life together, helping one another overcome. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, you know, Karen do that by, I, I've said this before, but you can do it in thousands of ways. But one of the things Karen and I do is we have coffee every day together. And, the, and, and um, we usually, even with the kids, we had 10 or 15 minutes where they couldn't interrupt us. I mean, if my 31-year-old daughter walked into a room today and we were having coffee sitting there, she would not interrupt us. Because she knows what that is about. It's about Karen and I connecting. And, and we'll talk about the day, we'll, but, we'll, but we'll, we'll talk about what's needed. We might talk about the kids. But it's just taking the time to stay connected. Something goes off on me. I, I'm, I'm very relational oriented. I can go for a few days and not be connected with Karen and I can really feel it, just a few days. And I can, I can go a few days with my kids. Now they're outside the home. And, but when they're in the home, I could go a few days and I could just feel like, hey, you know, we're not, we're not connected enough. And that doesn't mean I need something from them. It means that I want to give something to them and make sure that, that that relational piece is there. So the other thing I would say is give touch. And this might surprise you. But I'm not talking about sexuality. We talked about that last week in a very healthy fashion. God created sex. He created it for a man and woman in marriage. It's a beautiful thing. And it it's, it's shows itself most beautifully when it's the intimacy of its exclusivity between that biological man and that biological woman committed for life. There's no greater intimacy. My, you, you're, you're, you're my seat of affection. You're the only place that I give my love in this fashion. And so... So that's great, that's great. But now I wanna go beyond that to just the reality of what it means to hold hands or to hug or to embrace. Um, the connection of touch is important in the lives of humans. I wanna to read to you something from uh, a study, a medical study from medicine.net. It's medical research. And I don't think we have to be afraid of things if they, in reality, speak of physical reactions or, uh, I mean, God created us this way, right? 
But according to this study, a hug may make an individual feel happy by reducing feelings of loneliness, harmful physical effects, and stress. It can get rid of negative moods. You, you know, you've heard of dopamine, right? Dopamine is something chemically released from the brain. It's a pleasure hormone that makes an individual feel good. And dopamine is released in a pretty major way when people hug, when you hug family members, right? So you're helping them stay away from discouragement by just embracing them along the way. Serotonin is another thing that's an antidepressant that our brains uh, release. And that happens when we hug or hold hands. And it's a hormone that elevates our mood. Now you can just go through life and start not doing this because you've been married for a long time. And again, I'm not even talking sexual, I'm talking affection here. But it reduces our anxiety and it reduces uh, feelings of loneliness. So look on the screen here. This is what the study found. A 10 second hug helps the body fight infections. What? That's what the study found, that people were healthier. It eases depression and lessens tiredness. A 20 second hug reduces the harmful effects of stress, relieves blood pressure, and ensures a healthy family. And then further in the study, a hug ratio resulted in, in reduced blood pressure, which was, I said previously, decreased cortisol, improved healing. So there's this physical properties for the body, uh, reduced cravings and better immunity. So I said all that and it makes me want to hug Karen. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go down here. I'm just going to relieve any tension as I trip to come down. Man, oh man, she's so awesome. This is so great. I love it. We try to hug every day. Let's, let's end this sermon right now. Can we do that? No, no let's don't. I love you, honey. And I just want you to know that when you do that, peace comes. Like you're staying connected together. There's, there's peace and there's joy. And you're letting that person know you're really important to me. And this can be with, with friends and loved ones as well because it, there's nothing sexual about this. We're just, we're just hugging and it's, it's, it's like you mean something to me. Well, uh, I, I, uh, I like... I like the effects of that hug, and I think God, when he says, you know, be together relationally, that that is part of it. So don't let touch, non-sexual touch, don't let that go out of your relationship. Just find a way to just communicate to one another how special you are, because not everyone gets that embrace just like that, right? And it's just about the two of you staying connected closely together. Well, I'm going to, um, I'm going to skip on ahead here, uh, forgive me. But I don't want to, uh, the only thing between your lunch right now is me and this sermon. So I, I don't want to go too long. But let me just end with this. Happiness continues with forgiving. Forgiving. <sighs> Man. So a perfect marriage is a myth. Right? And... Um, Proverbs 15, 4 says, speech that heals is like a life-giving tree. But perverse speech breaks the spirit. And, and there has to be this attitude that we know the other one's not going to be perfect. Now, we're becoming better and better all the time, hopefully. I mean, I'm, that's one of the problems with athletes, man. We think we should continually improve on everything. And I'm trying to be perfect, and I just can't get there, you know? That can happen in sports and music and whatever. But we're, so we're working at it. We're trying to love and grow, but we're going to make mistakes. And we need to be careful the way we talk to one another. Someone said, never attribute to malice, never attribute malice, and that would be hatred or anger, to that which can be explained by thoughtfulness. That if we would have a forgiving, loving, caring attitude about others, it changes the conversation, it changes the feelings. There's a saying that um, the three hardest things for people to say is, I'm sorry, I was wrong, and Worcester sauce. I'm not even sure if I said that right. <clears throat> but forgiveness is such a big part. As a matter of fact, if you ask Karen, because I've heard her do this a number of times, if you ask her what she thinks is one of the keys to marriage or the most important advice she would give, this is the tip she gives. You, you need to learn to forgive. Forgive your spouse. So I remember her saying that and we got away from that conversation. You know, that wasn't my favorite thing. Because that's, that's, that's like me you're talking about. And she's like, well, yeah, that's right. 
I'm like, okay then, yeah. So I, I've had a wife who's been very forgiving to me and we have to forgive one another at times. I mean, the, the enemy, the Bible says forgive one another or God won't forgive you. Holy cow, that's, that's pretty intense because look at all the mistakes you've made and how God loves you anyway and forgave you. Wow, that's pretty amazing. And love means you don't have to be perfect that I'm here for you and we can grow together. Matthew 18, 21, Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? And Peter thinks he's doing good. Like seven, that's a lot, right? Think of the same thing. We're gonna forgive it seven times? And Jesus said, no, not seven times, but 70 times seven. If I'm not mistaken, that's 490 times. The point is, you're never gonna get there. Like it's, it's an infinite thing at some level. Now, I know that there's adultery and marriages can end and God would let it in and you can forgive someone. You can forgive someone and not be married to them anyway, by, anymore, by the way. And Jesus said, if they hurt you deeply, then I will allow you to put them away in a marriage if, if it was adultery. So, so there, 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 there's a limit at some level, but you can still forgive someone and move on because the trust is completely broken. But generally in marriage, because it's not that crazy of, 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 of a mistake, right? Generally, we're going to make a lot of mistakes um, with our communication, um, by not understanding someone's need, uh, you, you name it. It, it can be <clears throat> by speaking harshly. Uh, it can be by not showing up at something that was important. There's just so many things. And we need to learn to forgive one another. You know, uh, I think one of our biggest mistakes, biggest mistakes is we think our spouse should be us. We think they should think just like we do. And that's what the discussion is all around. But here's the deal. They're a different person. They don't think like you. And so you have to respect their feelings, their thoughts, and their opinions and, when, and, and then sometimes if they hurt you because of what they said, well, we need to make that communication as good as we can and be careful. But you're just, I'm just telling you, you're going to end up in a lot of spots where you have to say, I'm sorry. And you should. I can't tell you how many times, I, it's more than 490 that I've said I'm sorry to Karen and to my kids. But I will tell you this, I've never lost anything because I said I was sorry. I gained something usually with them. I didn't lose. <clears throat> And we, we have to carry this understanding that forgiveness is part of the foundation of a great marriage. Just let it go. I forgive you. I give it forth to the Lord. And you say, well, what if they keep doing it and keep doing it? Well, I don't know, 490 times. And, you know, if they, if they have a sincere heart, let's find some accountability. There's lots of ways that we can still work at it. But we can't carry unforgiveness in our heart because it will spoil marriage. I'm just going some places I didn't go in the first service. Most of the arguments in life are around, intense arguments in a marriage are around one thing. You say, what is that? I don't know, but it's their one thing. And it keeps circling back to that one thing. Maybe someone forsook them. And so they have this great fear. And when you did something, they, you know, it looks like they're being forsaken again. They're not but it might feel that way, a hippocampus, they call it. You, you feel the same as happened before and, and it's, it's happening again when it's not actually happening. But I would just say that that one thing, get it right before God and your spouse and let it go, man. I like what Stephen Wright, the comedian said, if, you're, if you lose your keys in hot molten lava, let them go, because man, they're gone. And what I would say is put, put this thing to rest. Talk it out, I had this hurt, you hurt me this way, whatever it was, put it to rest, put it behind you and don't bring it up again. The enemy will just circle you back to that one thing. I think this is just for a few people here, but thank the rest of you for listening in on that for just a moment. Um, but let me end with this. Well, I wanna read something to you. I gotta go back to get it. I have found that marriage has required me to change, grow and to become more honestly self-aware. I was and I, I am inherently selfish. I think we all are. 
I'm not still completely free of selfishness. And man, I'm up here preaching and trying to do it better every week, live right, right? But I'm not free of it. I'll say this, I've grown as a friend, a husband, a father, and I've grown substantially. And yet, I know there's still room for my growth. And I'm fighting the good fight to look more and behave more like Jesus in life for all my relationships and my family. Like, I haven't, I haven't hit it perfectly. But I, I want to be better because I love them. And I know the Lord wants to help me. Karen and I, I'm part of this uh, coaching program called Ready, Set, Grow. And when you get into it, one of the things they said is, okay, everybody in this coaching program has to go to counseling. So we like, we never done counseling, you know? And, and we're like, oh, okay. So we go to counseling. It ends up, it's just fun. It was great. It's like having that, that, that person there who loves the Lord and make it Bible counselor, you know, biblically based Christian counselor. And uh, I'll tell you this, Karen has learned a lot from that counseling. I'll just throw that out there for you, okay? But mostly what she's learned is how to deal with me. That's what, that's what she's learned with, because she's, she's as sweet as she can be. You know, like, like the one piece of marriage advice I could give people is marry Karen, and then you, you know, it's all, it's all easier, but you can't do that. So we, we got to do all the rest of this, right? She's pretty great, though. She's pretty great. But I, I want to grow, you guys. Here I am standing up here. I don't have it all together. But I love my family. I love Jesus. And he's leading me. And I'm growing. I'm becoming. And I think everything's getting better and better in marriage and family all the time. See, there seems to be two categories for husbands. Talking too much and talking too little. And I'm the too much guy over here. Right? But we, we can hit the sweet spot with God helping us in all of these things. And I'll end with this story right here. I've told it before a number of times you've heard it, but I don't know, I don't know one that illustrates what I'm saying better. So uh, many years ago, maybe 30 years ago, um, Karen and I are having a conversation. We're not in agreement, and it became an argument. And I, I did what the Bible says don't do. I spoke harshly to her. And that's, that's only a warning for the men, not for the women, interestingly enough. It must be our temptation. And, and um, now I think in, in the moment I know, I thought, what I, I thought what I was saying was right, but I didn't do it in a righteous way. Better to be righteous than right, right? Because tone and that, everything matters. Care, concern, what that person's feeling. So I walked out of there and I felt, hmm, I felt pretty good about it, you know? And I got downstairs and the Holy Spirit just smote my heart. <laughs> just an arrow, man. And it was like, uh, you just did wrong. You go up there and you apologize to her. So I received it pretty quickly. I thought it's very, oh, yeah, shoot. So I went up there and I said, Karen, I'm so sorry, honey. I shouldn't have talked to you that way. We, I asked the Lord to forgive me. Will you forgive me? And then one of her 490 times that week, she... Uh, wrapped her arms around me, we hugged, we prayed. And by the way, we pray in those moments just because the, whatever the enemy's trying to do, God will take it away when you pray together. He wants to divide you. Did you know, did you know that the devil in Greek, the word means it's Diablo and it means the one who divides? Isn't that interesting? And, and so he's always continued trying to divide what the Lord brings together. So I go, okay, I got it right. I'm walking out of that bedroom, made it right with Karen, and God speaks to me. The Holy Spirit says to me, your son just heard that, and you need to apologize to him. Well, he's five. So I go into the darkness of his bedroom, and um, sure enough, he's awake. And I said, hey, buddy, um, did you hear mom and dad in there? He said, I did, dad. He's five, and he says, you, you should not have talked to mom that way. I said, well, you, you're right. And I asked God to forgive me. I asked mom to forgive me. And now I'm asking you to forgive me. Will you forgive me? He said, sure, dad. No one's perfect. And I thought, he's five. You know, no one's perfect. I said, who told you that? He said, nobody. I've just been watching you. Okay, okay, so we got we to gotta walk with some humility as we figure this thing out, right? right? Come on, guys, walk with me. Walk, walk with me to, to, to be more self-aware, to grow up in Christ, to give them, because the truth is, instead of, when I say you, have, you think everybody should think like you, or we do, or I do, whatever it is, 
What I, what I mean is the way they want to be loved and spoken to is probably the way you need to love them and speak to them. Because you're talking to them about the way you receive love. But, but let's, let's put them ahead of ourselves. And, and ladies, I would say, I would say the uh, same. As a matter of fact, ladies, easy for you today because I skipped the part on submission in marriage to one another. Uh, but maybe I'll come back to it another time. Um, listen, man. Uh, I really love you and God really loves you and God wants your marriage to be great and I'm, I'm in danger because the enemy could uh, the enemy could hit us hard if I try to make every you know like everything's perfect between Karen and I well obviously you're here in spots where it's not right but I'm going to tell you the closer we get to Jesus and the more we've worked on this thing it's gotten better all the time and we are loving being married to one another we are loving life and we're so grateful that God is the one who helps us bring it all together, man. And I, I just would say this to you. You can trust him. You can trust him. Um, one fellow said, great marriages don't happen by luck or by accident. They're a result of a consistent investment of time, thoughtfulness, forgiveness, affection, prayer, mutual respect, and a rock-solid commitment between a husband and wife. So there's a scripture in 1 Peter 1.22 that says this. Follow Jesus and love one another deeply from the heart. And what we're talking about today is preferring them ahead of ourselves and loving on them. So maybe you can have a conversation around this today, get a cup of coffee just to, uh, or if you don't like coffee, I don't know, get water, whatever. Um, but conversations are good. I want you to bow your heads and we're gonna pray. Father, thank you for the truth of your love. Lord, I just, I just, Humbly want to thank you for helping me as I've, uh, as I, I just had such a need for growth and I was so focused on myself, Lord. And I'm, I'm just so grateful that you were patient with me, that Karen was patient with me. And Lord, uh, you've given us a reward. You've given Karen a reward for putting a crown a few inches above my head and, I, and I've been growing into it. And uh, Lord, I, I just speak for husbands. Would you help us to be self-aware and and get rid of our selfishness. I, I speak to wives. Would, would you help them to be focused on blessing their husbands without fear? And Lord, would you help us to, to stay close to you and to honor the truth of your word so that we might be blessed in a blessing. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.